Section 6.7 involves solving equations that have radicals in them where the variable is underneath the radical. So what you would want to do, you would think, is first off, get rid of the radical. And that is basically what you do. So you want to get rid of the radical and then you'll end up with an equation that will look more like things that we've had previously. However, when you have an equation with a radical in it, those are the times when you're most likely to see extraneous solutions, right? Basically, it's this, and then sometimes with word problems, right? Like if you have a word problem and you're solving for a length and you get a negative number, that's extraneous too. But here, um, it's worth checking your solutions, um, even though in theory, it's generally a good idea just to catch algebra errors and things. But here, you can have ones where you, you do everything correctly, but it's extraneous. It just doesn't work out when you do the check. So for these, I think that's a good idea. All right. So like it says here, if you've got one radical, um, you want to get rid of the radical. So you get the radical by itself if it's not already by itself. So number one, if you look at that, it's already by itself on the left side. But if I scroll down, number two would be one where you'd have to get the radical by itself first. It doesn't look like that's all that tough, right? You subtract three from both sides. It looks like that should take care of it. But you do have to get the radical by itself before you do anything else. Then number two, you would want to raise both sides um, to the power that would match up to whatever the index of your radical is. So basically what that's saying is if you have a square root, you square both sides, and then the resulting equation won't have a square root in it anymore. Um, or if you have a cube root, then cube both sides. If you have a fourth root, then raise both sides to the fourth power, that kind of thing. Then solve the equation and check to make sure that your solutions aren't extraneous. All right, so the first one, we've already got the root by itself and it's a square root, so we'd wanna square both sides. So we'd end up with the square root of four x plus one squared equal to five squared, but the square root of four x plus one squared is just four x plus one. So four x plus one is gonna be 25, but then if you subtract one from both sides, you get that four x is 24, but then if you divide both sides by four, it looks like x is six. All right, so let's check and make sure that this works. So if we sub in, we're gonna have four times six plus one, all right, well, that's the square root of 24 plus 1, which is the square root of 25, which is 5, and that works out because that's what's on the right side of the equation. So that solution works. So our solution to this problem would be the set consisting of just 6 to write it the way that they tend to write it in the homework and in the book um, in set notation like that. So, all right, that one worked. Um, number two, we got to do a little bit more because we got to get the root by itself. But when you look at two, you go, well, it's another square root. It looks like it ought to be about the same. Yeah, I think so. It'll be about the same length. So if we subtract three from both sides to get that square root by itself, we're going to have the square root of 5x plus 6 equal to negative 1, right? 2 minus 3 on the, on the right side. All right. Well, then if we square both sides, since we've got a square root, we'll have the square root of 5x plus 6 squared equal to negative 1 squared. So then we've got that 5x plus 6 is equal to 1. And if we solve this, so you subtract 6 from both sides, you get that 5x is negative 5. And then if you divide both sides by 5, you get that x is negative 1. Okay. Well, let's check it. So if we check, um, then in the original equation, if I sub in on the left, we'll have five times negative one plus six under the radical and then plus three. All right, well then five times negative one is negative five. So this will be the square root of negative five plus six, and then plus three. So this is the square root of one plus three so this is one plus three, which is four. Doesn't work, right? We're supposed to get a two, we're getting a four. So that means, let me put this in a different color. Um, that would mean that x equals negative one. 
is extraneous. So that was the only potential solution that we had. And saying that one's extraneous means we're left with nothing. So then the solution is going to be the empty set. So either written as the set with nothing in it or the circle with the diagonal line. Either notation, right? So that's, that's going to be the empty set because nothing worked. We had one potential solution that turned out to be extraneous. So it doesn't look like anything's going to solve that. At least there's not going to be a real number that does it. All right. Let's see what else we've got here. A cube root. Okay. Let's see what happens here. So we got to get that cube root by itself, right? So subtract six from both sides to do that first. And we're going to have that the cube root of 3x minus 8 is equal to negative 2. Okay. Well, we want to get rid of that cube root. And it's a different type of root this time, right? Before we had square roots, so we would square to get rid of the square root. Here you got a cube root, so you got a cube to get rid of the cube root. So we're going to have the cube root of 3x minus 8 cubed equals negative 2 cubed. So the cube root cubed, you just get 3x minus 8 on the left. But then when you cube negative 2, that's negative 8. So 3x minus 8 equals minus 8. Um, if you add 8 to both sides, that would imply that 3x equals 0. But then if that's the case, then x must be 0. And then we can go back and check just to make sure that this works. Or just to see if it works. It's an odd root, so actually we're going to be fine. But let's see. If we, if we sub in, we'll have 3 times 0 minus 8 and then plus 6. And we want this to work out to be 4, right? So this will be, well, 3 times 0 is 0. So this is the cube root of negative 8 plus 6. So that's negative 2 plus 6. Yep, that's 4. That works. That's what we're supposed to get on the right side, and we got it. So that means that the solution is going to be the set consisting of 0. All right. So... There is a way to anticipate when you're going to have extraneous solutions. Never with an odd root. Um, the thing that causes trouble is when you have an even root. More specifically, it's when you have an even root set equal to a negative number. So it's when you have a thing that looks like that. So like when I'm doing it, this is the part where I know we're getting an extraneous solution. When it's even root set equal to a negative number. So, right, I mean, that's what that is, right? You got a square root on one side, you got a negative one on the other. So that's, in my brain, I'm like, okay, it's coming. This time we're going to get an extraneous solution. Um, the odd roots don't have that problem. Um, and it's because of how you can, well, basically because you can take the cube root of an odd number or the fifth root of an odd number and you get an odd, right? So uh, what you end up with with odd roots is it's one to one. Right? For any number, there's one number that you could cube and get there. Right? Like for negative 8, you cube negative 2 and you get the negative 8. But there's nothing else you could cube and get the negative 8. Um, but with squares, that's the thing. Like if, you know, like if you have a, I don't know, 49. Um, 7 squared is 49, but so is negative 7 squared. Um, but then if you just had square root of 49, to simplify, you would just say that's a 7. Right? And... <clears throat> That's the thing that ultimately causes trouble. So really, <clears throat> it's because there isn't that one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, so like that's the reasoning behind it. But the thing to look for if you want to anticipate when you're going to get an extraneous solution is when you have an even root set equal to a negative number. That's when they have it. You'll never get one with an odd root ever. You'll never get one with a, with a cube root or with a fifth root or the seventh root or anything like that. Um, but you might get one with like a square root or a fourth root. So um, that's how you can catch them, like sort of as they're happening. Because um, notice in number three, we ended up with a cube root equal to a negative, and that was fine, right? We had the cube root of 3x minus 8 equal to negative 2, and it worked, it worked out okay, right? Um, the solution worked. They always do. For, for odd roots like cube roots, they're going to work. Um, it's just with square roots and fourth roots, that's when you got to watch out. 
All right, so then number four, oh, this is interesting. Um, with number four, we've got the root by itself, but it, we've got a little more than just a number on the other side. So let's see, if we square both sides to get rid of that square root, we have the square root of 3x minus 11 squared equals x minus 5 quantity squared. And the square of the square root, we know what we're going to get there. 3x minus 11 on the left side. Um, on the right, that's one of those special products that we would have had, like back in chapter 4. When you square the binomial, you'll get x squared minus 10x plus 25. Okay, now we got to solve this. So get a 0 on one side. I think it'll be easier to get a 0 on the left. So I'm just going to do that, minus 3x plus 11 on both sides. So then on the left, we're going to have a 0. On the right, we're going to have x squared minus 13x plus 36, which factors. Because we need to pair factors of 36 to add up to negative 13. That would be negative 9 and negative 4. Okay, then 0 product property. If x minus 9 equals 0, that would mean that x would have to be 9. And then if x minus 4 equals 0, then x is going to have to be 4. And then we'll have to do the check for both of these. Um, although I think you can figure out in advance which one is going to be extraneous. Because one of these will work and one of them won't. The one that won't work is the 4. And the reason for that is look at what would happen on the right side. If you sub in a 4, you're going to get a negative. You're going to get 4 minus 5, which is negative 1, so you're going to have a squared equal to a negative. That's when you get the extraneous solution. But the 9 looks like it should be okay, right? Because 9 minus 5 is 4. It's positive. It should be fine. So let's see what happens. And not that this is a big spoiler. It's going to be exactly that. The 9 is going to work and the 4 is going to fail. Um, but let's see, with 9, I guess we'll have to do the left and right sides individually and just make sure they match. So for the left side, you'd have the square root of 3 times 9 um, minus 11. All right, so that's going to be the square root of 27 minus 11, which would be the square root of 16, which is 4. And then on the right side, you would have 9 minus 5 which is 4. That works, right? Left and right side worked out to be the same things. And then what about when x equals 4? All right, well then on the left side we would have 3 times 4 minus 11, which would be the square root of 12 minus 11, which is the square root of 1, which is 1, right? But then on the right side we're going to have 4 minus 5, which is negative 1. Nope. Right? They don't match up. So the 4 is extraneous. So x equals 4 is extraneous. So the solution, the set consisting of just the 9. Since that one worked and the 4 didn't. Okay. Next, with number five, um, with number five, the only thing that's really new is the notation. Um, so it doesn't use radical notation, it uses exponential notation, but you still basically do the same thing. So you want to get that 2y minus 1 to the 1 half by itself, first of all. And then you want to get rid of that raising to the power of 1 half. So that's what we're going to do. First things first, get it by itself, right? So if you add 2 to both sides, That'll get it by itself. So we'd have 2y minus 1 to the 1 half equals 5. All right. Well, then we would rather have just a 2y two two minus 1, not a 2y minus 1 to the 1 half. So the thing that you can use if you're going to stick with the um, exponential notation here is that law of exponents where... When you raise a power to another power, you can multiply them together. So ultimately, you'd want an expression on the left where you'd be raising to the power of 1. So 1 half times 2 would give you 1. So what you would do with that 
is then square both sides. And that should give us the thing that we're looking for. So square that, and then on the right, we're going to square that 5. So, all right, well then on the left, that's going to be 2y minus 1 to the 1 half times 2, right? There's that law of exponents, and that's equal to 25. But that's just raising to the first power. So this is 2y minus 1. And then from there, the solving's not too bad, right? You add 1 to both sides, you get 2y equals 26. You divide both sides by 2, you get that y is 13. And then we just have to check and make sure that this works. Um, so if we check it, we'll have 2 times 13 minus 1 to the 1 half minus 2. And we just got to make sure that works out to be 3. So in the parentheses, that's 26 minus 1. So 26 minus 1 to the 1 half minus 2. So that's going to be 25 to the 1 half minus 2. But 25 to the 1 half, it's the square root of 25. So it's just 5. So 5 minus 2. And that is 3, which is what we're supposed to get. That's what's on the right side of the original equation. So it looks like we're all good. And the solution is going to be the set consisting of just 13. All right, another thing here is for some people, and I think I would include myself in this, I think these feel easier when they're written with radicals. I don't know why, but it just feels like that. And maybe that's because that's usually what you get, but for whatever reason, um, you could rewrite five, right? You could, and I guess let me just do this in a different color, um, but you could rewrite five like this as the square root of 2y minus 1 and then minus 2 equals 3. That's the same thing, just using different notation. So if that feels more comfortable, you could always just do that first um, and then you can solve it with a radical. And then you, know, you get the square root by itself, you square both sides, you go from there. So you actually end up doing basically the same steps too, um, even if you switch the notation around a little. All right, then let's see, number six. All right, well, number six, we have two roots, but they're both cube roots, and it looks like if we cubed both sides, we would effectively get rid of both of the cube roots, and that's true. So it looks like that's what you want to do to this, and that's, what, that's exactly what we're going to do with it. So cube root of a squared minus 3a plus 5 cubed equals the cube root of 2a squared minus 6a minus 23 cubed. And when you cube the cube roots, you just get the radicands. So a squared minus 3a plus 5 equals 2a squared minus 6a minus 23. And then um, get a zero on one side, and we should have a quadratic equation to solve. So I'm going to get a zero on the left, because since the coefficient on the right of the a squared term is bigger, if I get the zero on the left, I'll get a positive coefficient of a squared. So that's kind of what I'm shooting for. So minus a squared plus 3a minus 5. And over here, minus a squared plus 3a minus 5. And what we're going to end up with is a 0 on the left, and then on the right we're going to have a squared minus 3a minus 28. And that factors. So it's going to factor into a minus 7 times a plus 4. So then if a minus 7 equals 0, then a must be 7. And if a plus 4 equals 0, then a must be negative 4. And then we just have to check both of them. <clears throat> These should both work because we've got odd roots, right? We've got two cube roots. So both of these should be fine, but we'll check just to make sure. All right, so the first one is, it's a, not x. So a equals 7. All right, so the left side, we'd have the cube root of let's see, 7 squared minus 3 times 7. Oops, 7 plus 5. 
All right, that's going to be the square root of 49 minus 21 plus 5. All right, so that's 28 plus 5, which is 33. So this is the square root of 33. Right side, we're going to have the cube root of 2 times 7 squared minus 6 times 7 minus 23. All right, well, 7 squared is 49, then 2 times that is 98. So we got 98 minus 42 minus 23. So that's 56 minus 23, which is 33. All right, square root of 33 in both. So seven works. And then with negative four, we can do the same thing. So the left side, it's gonna be the cube root of negative four squared minus three times negative four plus five. All right, well then, and I forgot the cube roots up here. There. Um, all right, this will be the cube root of 16 plus 12 plus five. Again, cube root 33. All right, what about the right side? We'll have the cube root of two times negative four squared minus six times negative four and then minus 23. All right, negative four squared is 16 times two is 32. So we're gonna have the square root of 32 plus 24 minus 23. Yep, All right, that's gonna be 56 minus 23, which is 33. So that's gonna be the cube root of 33, so that also works. So the solution is going to be 7 and negative 4. That's a sorry looking left bracket. Let me fix that up. Um, but they do both work this time, and they should. It's an odd root. <clears throat> and generally, the odd roots tend to always check out. You don't get the extraneous solutions there. All right, um, there is one last thing where number six has two roots in it, but we still kind of did what we were doing before, right? Um, you could look at it as that either of those roots was already isolated and we just cubed and we got something with no roots in it. That doesn't always work because what if you have something like number seven? So um, the steps here for how to solve a radical equation with two radicals, these are much more relevant for something like number seven than something like number six. So with, with either one, I mean, you would follow these steps, but um, like one of the radicals is already isolated number six. You could argue that they both are. Um, and then they were both cube roots, so we just cubed both sides and we kind of had it. So when you get to step three, number six is 3a because um, both radicals were eliminated when we cubed both sides, right? Um, 3b, that's going to be what happens in number 7, because we'll be able to get one of those radicals by itself, and they're square roots, so we're going to square both sides, but then the resulting equation is still going to have a square root in it, so we're going to have to do it again. So I'll show you what I mean. What we're going to have to do with number 7 is, let's say if we want to get that square root of x plus 5 by itself. So you'd add radical x to both sides. So then we'd have the square root of x plus 5 equals 1 plus the square root of x, right? Um, and then if we square both sides, then the left side is the square of a square root, so it's just x plus 5. However, the right side, if you multiply this out, um, like if you FOIL it, you'll get 1 plus 2 radical x plus x. So you get an expression that still has a square root in it. And then you think, well, then what are we supposed to do with this? Um, well, what you do with it is now you kind of do the thing that we just did. Um, that leftover radical x, you need to get it by itself. So I guess first get the term of the radical x by itself. I'm going to subtract 1 and subtract x from both sides. 
and then that way I'll have the two radical x alone. So on the left, if you subtract x and subtract y, you're just going to be left with a 4, right? x minus x, those are going to add out or subtract out. Um, so then 5 minus 1 is 4. And then on the right side, you'd just be left with 2 radical x. Okay, if you divide both sides by 2, you would get that 2 is equal to radical x. And now, if we squared both sides, so 2 squared equals radical x squared. We get a 4 on the left, we get an x on the right. And we can go back and check this one, but this one looks like it should work out. So if we do the check, all right, we're going to have the square root of 4 plus 5 minus the square root of 4. So this is the square root of 9 minus the square root of 4, which is going to be 3 minus 2, which is 1. And that is what we're supposed to get. That's on the right side of the original equation. So that means that the solution is going to be just 4. All right. So it looks like that takes care of that one. Um, it's a little bit different when you have the two radicals like this. And basically, you can tell when you're going to have to do this, when, when you have to isolate one radical, get rid of it, then isolate the other radical, and then get rid of that one. Um, it happens when you have other terms besides just the radicals. Because in 6, we did. If I scroll up to 6 for a second, it's just cube root on one side, cube root on the other side. So in that case, you cube both sides. You don't have any radicals anymore. But with number seven, you got the two square roots, but you also have that one in the original equation. That one is the thing that's causing trouble, right? Because then you say, well, if that wasn't there, like if that was a zero, then you'd end up with square root of x plus five equals square root of x. You'd square both sides. You wouldn't have any radicals anymore, right? Um, but it's because we've got that constant there, that one. And so then when we squared the quantity one plus radical x, when you foil that out, it's the outer and inner terms that have got the radical x, right? And so then we didn't entirely get rid of it, so then we just have to kind of do the same process again, right? Get the, that radical by itself, and since it's a square root, you square both sides, and then finally you would have no radicals anymore. Um, that's as long as they get, though. So, like, if number seven makes sense, I would think the rest of this section that you'd be fine with um, all I would really say is just watch out for the extraneous solutions. Um, and it is true that really it's, that's only going to be an issue when you have an even root equal to a negative number, right? It was when that happens um, that that's when you're going to get the extraneous solutions. So like odd roots, never going to happen. Like cube roots, you're never going to get any extraneous solutions. Um, the check might still be worth it, though, just to make sure that you don't have an algebra error someplace, but you won't get an extraneous solution with, like with a cube root or a fifth root or anything. Um, but yeah, I think that would basically cover it for section 6.7. Um, this is one that I thought would be a lot longer than it is um, in terms of like the handout and the video and everything. So I suppose that's a plus that it ended up being a little bit shorter than what I expected.